morning. This morning I want to begin with prayer. From time to time I read a prayer from the Valley of Vision. I don't know if you know what the Valley of Vision is. It's a, it's a little book that is filled with Puritan prayers. And it's a book that I often use and return to as kind of a devotional. Uh, these are rich prayers from Puritans. And I'm going to read a prayer as we begin. And it's called Need of Jesus. Would you bow with me? Lord Jesus, we are blind but you are light. Ignorant, be our wisdom. Self-willed, be our mind. Open our ears to grasp quickly your Spirit's voice and delightfully run after his beckoning hand. Melt our conscience that no hardness remain. Make it alive to evil's slightest touch. When Satan approaches, may we flee to your wounds and there cease to tremble at all alarms. Be our good shepherd to lead us into the green pastures of your word and cause us to lie down beside the rivers of its comforts. Fill us with peace that no disquieting worldly gale may ruffle the calm surface of our soul. Your cross was upraised to be our refuge. Your blood streamed forth to wash us clean. Your death occurred to give us surety. Your name is our property to save us. I was a stranger, an outcast, a slave, a rebel. But your cross has brought us near, has softened our heart has made us your father's child, has admitted us to your family, has made us joint heirs with yourself. Oh, that we may love you as you love us, that we may walk worthy of you, Lord, that we may reflect the image of heaven's firstborn. May we always see your beauty with the clear eye of faith and feel the power of your spirit in our heart, for unless He move mightily in us. No inward fire will be kindled. In the matchless name of Jesus, amen. The human heart is a perpetual idol factory. John Calvin said that. Uh, What I believe Calvin was getting at with that quote, again, the human heart is a perpetual idol factory. What I think Calvin was getting at is not so much that we're capable of turning anything into an idol, rather that we automatically turn everything into an idol. And why is it that we automatically turn anything and everything into an idol? Yes, we're depraved, we're fallen, we're prone to wander, as the song says. But just as much, the reason we instinctively turn anything and everything into an idol is that you and I were created to worship. As Ted Tripp says, we have a Godward orientation. We have a Godward orientation. In other words, everyone is religious. No one is neutral. Either we worship the God of the Bible or we worship an idol. This means that in any moment we are either worshiping and serving and growing in our understanding of who God is or we're seeking to make sense of life outside of God. We are either looking to God for understanding, for peace, for joy and for security, or we're propping up something else, some idol to bring us such things. Of course, Psalm 14.1 says, the fool declares, there is no God. He doesn't cease to be a worshiper, however. He simply chooses to worship, worship that which is not God. Therefore, The question for us is never, will you worship? Rather, the question is always, whom 
will you worship? Whom will you worship? So then, what is an idol? What is an idol? Tim Keller, he writes this, quote, It is anything more important to you than God, anything that absorbs your heart and your imagination more than God, anything you seek to give you what only God can give. He continues, quote, An idol is anything so central and essential to your life that should you lose it, he says, your life would feel hardly worth living. What kinds of things do we shape, do we carve, do we chisel into idols? What exactly can become so central and essential to our lives that should we lose it, our life would be unlivable? Family, children, career, money-making, achievement, critical acclaim, saving face, social standing, romantic relationships, sex, competence, skill, security, comfortable circumstances, your beauty, you're beautiful, your brains, you're smart, a great political or social cause, your morality, virtue, even success in Christian ministry can be an idol. All these good things can be shaped, molded, carved, chiseled into idols. Tim Keller again, quote, An idol is whatever you look at and say in your heart of hearts, if I have that, then... I'll feel my life has meaning. Then, I'll know I have value. Then, I'll feel significant and secure. There are many ways to describe that kind of relationship to something, but perhaps the best one, he says, is worship. It's significant that Keller calls his book Counterfeit Gods because <laughs> they're idols. After all, what do people do with idols? What is their purpose? We worship them. Now, my goal this morning is not so much to help you discern the idols that exist in your own heart. I trust the Spirit will do that. Um, rather, my goal this morning is to point your heart, to point your heart in the direction of the living God, who is the source of every true need as the title of my message suggests. And it's my hope that in doing so, the living God might topple over the idols that exist in my own heart, our hearts, so that we might look to Him as the fountainhead of true life. In order to do this, I want to share four facts that teach us that our every true need is found in God. Four facts that teach us that our every true need is found in God. And again, it's my hope is that, it is, is that as a result, we might look to him as the fountainhead of true life. As you know, we're studying the gospel of John and we're continuing our study in John chapter 14, starting at verse 25. You can look there with me. It says there in 1425, these things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, Jesus says. These words help us to remember something of the context that we're in in this gospel and where we've been studying uh, in chapter 14. These words are spoken on the night before Jesus was crucified. In just a couple of hours, Jesus would be arrested. He would be tried. He would be uh, crucified and laid in a tomb. If, if these events happened about six to, between 6 and 9 o'clock in the evening, you remember Jesus would go out in the garden, he would pray, he would be arrested. The trial would happen basically overnight, and by noon the next day, he would be on the cross. So we're very close to the crucifixion in, these, in this encounter with the disciples. So Jesus is leaving. If you look over at chapter 13 and verse 33, just to remember the, contra the context here, he says there in verse 13, 33, little children, yet I leave Yet a little while I am with you, you will seek me, and just as I said to you, said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. And so just a little while, he is going to be with them, and then he is going to leave. 
And yet, while Jesus planned to leave, as we saw last week, He is going to send another helper or leave another helper, or we like that word advocate, a helper or an advocate. Look at chapter 14 and verses 16 and 17. And I will ask the Father, Jesus says, and He will give you another helper, another advocate, to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees Him nor knows Him. You know Him, for He dwells with you, and Jesus says, He will be in you. It was the Spirit of truth that would indwell the disciples. As Jesus says, the Spirit was with them, but would be soon enough would be in them. Having promised the disciples that the Spirit would be in them, He makes another promise in our verse today, in verse 26, chapter 14 and verse 26. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, He says, whom the Father will send in My name, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. And so the helper, the Holy Spirit, will do two things, will teach all things and bring to remembrance all that Jesus said. With these words, we have the first fact that teaches us that our every true need is found in God. We find out here that He is the source of true revelation. He is the source of true revelation. Now, the most natural question to ask from this verse is, Of whom is Jesus speaking? That is, to whom will Jesus teach all things and bring to remembrance all that he has said? In other words, is this promise for us? Or is it for the disciples, for the apostles, for the 11 that Jesus is specifically speaking to? That's the most natural question that comes out of this verse. In order to answer this question, we have to recall how the disciples are portrayed in the Gospel of John. Repeatedly, the disciples are shown to fall woefully short in understanding Jesus and His words. There's a couple places we could show this from, but even in this immediate context, um, we can show this. If you look over at chapter 14, look at verse 5. Remember, Jesus has just said that he's going to leave. He tells them to not be troubled, believe in God, believe also in me. He says he's going to go prepare a place for them. And in verse 5 there, 14, 5, Thomas said to him, to Jesus, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, very memorably, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And then he rebukes him. If you had known me, the assumption is, you don't know me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father. Also, from now on, you do know him and have seen him. And Philip says to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Again, another rebuke. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me? Of course, the assumption is they don't know him. Philip, he says, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? So these disciples, although they understood something about who Jesus was, they they lacked a, a key understanding of who he was ultimately. And John does this throughout his gospel. So they're returning to verse 26, again, chapter 14, verse 26. What Jesus is saying is that one of the the Spirit's principal tasks after Jesus is glorified is to rightly teach and remind these apostles of all that has happened regarding the ministry of Jesus. John even acknowledges such a thing throughout his gospel. He uses some foreshadowing throughout the book to demonstrate this. Uh, If you want to follow me over to John chapter 2, I'll show you a couple verses here. John chapter 2 and verse 19 This is when Jesus cleans the temple out or clears the temple. You remember he went in and he drove out the money changers. He poured out all their money. He overturned their tables. And then chapter 2 and verse 18. So the Jews said to him, What sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Verse 20. The Jews then said, It has taken 
It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking about the temple of his body. And then look at this, verse 22. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this. And they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. So John is doing some foreshadowing there, looking forward to that time that there would be some kind of revelation and they would understand the meaning of such things. Look at chapter 12. Here's another example. John chapter 12 and verse 16. This is the triumphal entry. They couldn't have known what all this meant when they were actually experiencing it. You see there in verse 13, they took branches of palm trees, the people, you remember the large crowds, they went out to Jesus, they cried out, Hosanna, save us, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel, quoting Psalm 118. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. It's a quote from Zechariah 9.9. Jesus is fulfilling all these prophecies, Psalm 118, Zechariah 9.9. Look at verse 16. His disciples did not understand these things. They didn't know what all this stuff meant. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. So again, this foreshadowing idea that eventually these disciples would have some kind of greater knowledge and they would understand deeper meanings that were happening with these events concerning Jesus. Therefore, based on the the portrayal of the the apostles in the Gospel of John and these kind of foreshadowing that John does throughout the Gospel, I do not think Jesus or John gives us this detail that that Jesus is going to teach and the Holy Spirit's going to come and teach and bring to their remembrance all that he said. I do not think John gives us this detail to explain how we are taught by the Spirit. He does that somewhere else. So you have to go to 1 John to learn that. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 20, uh, we learn there that in fact the Holy Spirit does teach us. But here he's not talking about this, that. He is talking about the Holy Spirit teaching the disciples, teaching the disciples. Now why is this important? And how does it teach us that God is the source of true revelation? Well, who wrote this gospel? John, who wrote this historical account of the life of Jesus. Furthermore, we have other historical accounts. We have the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all of which were written by apostles or had an apostle standing behind the author, you might say. Peter stood behind Mark, and Peter and Paul both stood behind Luke's Gospel. And so you have kind of the apostles that stood behind or wrote these accounts of Jesus. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21 is helpful. He writes, again, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit guided these men to give us Holy Scripture, what the Bible teaches. And so, what does this say about the words that lay before us? It means these words are without error. It means their instruction pertains to all of life and godliness. Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him. And we have that knowledge written down in Scripture. In many ways, John 14, 26, this verse here that we're looking at, is the bedrock of gospel truth. Everything we believe rises and falls on this reality. That the God of the universe taught and reminded certain men by the power of the Holy Spirit to record such, th- such things in Holy Scripture. In this way, God has given us the source of true revelation. If you would, I know I'm having you move around a little bit. Look over at Psalm, Psalm 19. I want to show you this. Psalm 19. We 
We talk about the way that God reveals himself in the world. We often talk about general revelation. And we talk about special revelation. Right? General re- revelation is, is everyone has access to general revelation. But only those who have God's word have access to special revelation. Or you might even call it scriptural revelation. Psalm 19 shows us both of these kinds of revelation. You remember Psalm 19 verse 1. Very memorable verse. The heavens declare the glory of God. The heavens declare the glory of, glory of God. Now, the, the word God there is significant because it's a general word for God. Right? It's like our word for God. We talk about false gods. We talk about God, the one true God. We use the same word to describe it. It's the word Elohim. It's the same kind of word in Hebrew. It's a general word for God. The heavens declare the glory of God. And his sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. It's continuous. It's abundant. It's universal. Verse 3, there's no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out throughout all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. And so the, the creation is uh, anthropomorphized. It's, 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 it's as if it's speaking like a man. Of course, we know it doesn't speak, but it communicates something. So man looks out into the heavens and can see there is a God. In the words of Romans 1, Paul says it's plain to them. So no one can say there's no God. What men do is they suppress that truth in their unrighteousness. That's what they do. They know God exists, but they love their sin more than to acknowledge that there is a God. And so they suppress the truth of of the creator in their unrighteousness. That's bringing Romans 1 into it. So that's general revelation. Everyone has access to that. But then there's special revelation. If you look down at verse 7, the law of the Lord, he kind of switches directions there. You could say, but the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. He doesn't say the law of God, Elohim. He says the law of the Lord, Yahweh. So now we have special revelation. We would never know what God's name was unless he told us. And you remember he told us when? The burning bush. Who should I, you want me to free your people? Well, who are you? Who should I say sent me? I am who I am, Yahweh. And so now we have, we have special revelation. We know that this isn't just some general God out there. It's not the God of the Egyptians. It's a unique God, the one true God, Yahweh. This is what this is talking about here. The law of the Lord, the law of Yahweh is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The, the precepts are the statutes of the Lord. This is how you govern, govern your life, how you live your life according to this one true God. They're right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. This relates to how we worship. The rules of the Lord, the, His judicial decisions, you might say, they're true and righteous altogether. How are we going to think about those things? If those are the attributes of the word, well, are we to appreciate them? Well, look at what it says in verse 10. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. So we have God's special revelation through his scripture, through the apostles, as God brought to their remembrance and taught them these things, they recorded the New Testament. So the question for us is, where are we seeking knowledge? If this is true, the living God has given us His true word, the highest source of revelation, where do we seek knowledge in our day-to-day life? What knowledge idol exists in our heart. I think most Christians fall into this kind of, that that fall into, most Christians that fall into this kind of idolatry don't reject God's revelation outright. We we keep God's revelation, but what do we do? We kind of add something to it, right? We pair it with something. We don't want to say that God's word, you don't want to invalidate God's word, but it's God's word plus something else. God's word plus some psychoanalysis. Or God's word plus some kind of behavior model. The Enneagram is very popular right now. It's God's word plus that. 
It could even be Scripture plus a gifted teacher or a kind of ministry. We add something to Scripture. I love what Charles Spurgeon said, very memorable. The Word of God is like a lion. You don't have to defend a lion. All you have to do is let the lion loose, and the lion will defend itself. Scripture will defend itself. Scripture is enough. It is God's true and highest revelation. Scripture doesn't need any help. No animal has the power and strength and effectiveness of a lion. No resource has the power and strength and effectiveness of holy Scripture. Our God is therefore the source of true revelation. Here's a second point. Look at verse 27. Jesus says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give it to you. Let not your heart be troubled. Your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. God is the source of true revelation and God is the source of true peace. He is the source of true peace. In connection with the coming of the Holy Spirit, Jesus promises not only to leave, but to give peace. Notice Jesus isn't wishing them peace in the sense of saying goodbye, peace. That's not what he's doing. He is offering them peace as an objective reality is what he's doing. He says, my peace I give to you. It's an objective peace that he gives. Paul tells us in Philippians 4 and verse 7 that peace puts a garrison, a fortress, you might say, on our hearts and minds against the invasion of anxiety. Peace does that. Paul exhorts us in Colossians 3.15, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful. The peace of Christ is like a ruler that leads us towards unity. The peace that Christ offers is our emissary, you might say, against anxiety and against argument. The peace is an advocate. This peace is an advocate for rejoicing and reconciliation. In the midst of trouble, this peace secures composure and cancels out fear. Look at the end of verse 27 there. Let, your, let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. The world offers peace on many fronts. Meditate. Take a break. Live in the present. Cultivate a positive mental attitude. This is the way, these are the ways the world offers us peace. Be kind to yourself. Develop love for yourself. Take a walk. Take a deep breath. Practice self-care. Express yourself. Visualize peace. Be grateful. Work on acceptance. Practice non-judgment. Foster deeper connections. These are worldly things. Worldly forms of peace. Notice what Jesus says about the peace he gives. Not as the world gives it, he says. Do I give it to you? The world is so proud about the peace it offers, but the world is powerless. It's powerless to give peace. You can't eat right enough. You can't exercise right enough. You can't dress right enough. Save right enough. Think right enough. Wait right enough. Work right enough. Retire right enough. Parent right enough. Obey right enough. Put the pieces of your life together right enough to find peace. It's impossible. Any attempt, this is a long sentence, any attempt to achieve personal tranquility or political stability, whether by ritual, by mysticism, propaganda, without dealing with the ground-level reasons for strife and enmity held up in the human heart is exceedingly hopeless. Which is another way of saying, or a fancy way of saying, that our God is the source of true peace. 
You might remember in the Old Testament how the leaders of Israel, they dressed the wounds of their idolatry. Book of Jeremiah. Remember, peace, peace, they said. Peace, peace. Jeremiah tells us they weren't even ashamed. They didn't even blush at declaring peace to the people. It was a false peace. The best the world can offer is to fly a flag of peace as a greeting. It says peace, peace, yet it cannot offer us true peace. Only Christ can give us peace. As he says, my peace I give to you. I know there are some students here. If you study that long period in in Roman history, that 200-year period of uh, history of, of peace, Pax Romana, that long period in history that there was 200 years of peace. Maybe you've studied that in your history classes. Unprecedented peace and economic prosperity in the Roman Empire. How was it that Caesar Augustus and the Roman Empire were was able to achieve such a peace. How did they do that? Well, it was one, it was secured, and it was maintained with the sword. It's always the sword. If it's true that 200 years of peace were secured with a sword, that is true, but a greater and more lasting peace was secured with a mightier sword. Jesus is our warrior who defended the greatest of foes, defeated the greatest of foes, sin, death, and Satan. When Jesus was led to the cross, he was entering into a cosmic battle. The victor was determined on the third day. He defeated death. Here's the beauty of the gospel. We have peace because Jesus fought the greatest war. 2 Corinthians 5.21, for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might be the righteousness of God. He died in our place as our substitute in order that we might become God's righteousness. And as a result, there is no longer any enmity, any hostility between us and God. We have access to God through the death of his son. And it's so simple that all he says is that we have to believe. That's it. Just believe in me and you can have access to the living God. If you're seeking to find peace in anything but the prince of peace, friends, we're seeking an idol. He's the only one that can offer us true peace. Because he is the Prince of Peace. There's a third item. Verses 28 and 29. Our God is the source of true revelation. He's the source of true peace. And thirdly, the source of true joy. Look down at verses 28 and 29. The source of true joy. You heard me say to you, I am going away and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced. Why? Because I am going to the Father. For the Father, he says, is greater than I. And now I have told you before, and now I have told you, you and, and now I have told you before it takes place, so that when it does take place, you may believe. Jesus returns again to this topic, the topic of his departure. And again, he rebukes the disciples. I have another rebuke from them, because they don't understand what's happening fully. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced. In other words, if you truly loved me, if they truly loved Christ, and the implication again is that they don't, they would have rejoiced that he was going to the Father. It would have been their joy that he was leaving. To be clear, I don't think the disciples, I do think the disciples loved Jesus, yet these words, of course, reveal that they they lacked a certain kind of love. Their lack of love was evidenced by their failure failure to rejoice at his departure. The the disciples saw the Lord's departure only uh, as a loss to themselves. Where are you going? Don't leave us. 
They were selfish. They didn't think about what it would gain him. How amazing it would be for him. What would it mean for him to leave? It would mean everything to Jesus. Jesus had left the indescribable glories of heaven where he experienced perfect fellowship with his Father. The Bible tells us that although he existed in the form of God, he didn't think that that was a thing that he should hold on to. He didn't grasp for that thing like we would expect him to have. He didn't regard the presence with the Father a thing to be held on to, but he emptied himself. This is what Paul teaches us in Philippians chapter 2. He emptied himself by taking the form of a man. He didn't empty himself by changing anything of his divine nature. That's clear from Colossians 3.19. For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. He was completely God. Nothing was taken away from his deity. But he added something to himself. It's a, the, it's the subtraction is, it's a subtraction by addition, if you can say that. He emptied himself by becoming a man. By adding a human nature to himself. That's how he emptied himself. We can only imagine, therefore, what joy would have filled his heart to think about returning to the presence of the Father. John 17 Remember the high priestly prayer, it's, it's, as it's so often called in John, John, John chapter 17. Look, at the, look there with me, John 17, verses 1 through 5. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, Jesus says, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And look at verse 5. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. For him to leave, it meant going back to the Father. But these disciples, they don't see it that way. They don't get it. They're too selfish to see that. They should have rejoiced. So you know, a little statement there is somewhat confusing sometimes. People have taken this to mean different things. At the end of verse 28 there, I'm going away and I will come to you. If you love me, you would have rejoiced because I am going to the Father for the Father is greater than I. For the Father is greater than I. He's speaking from his incarnate state, from his human nature there. By taking on a human form, Jesus took on a certain subordination, you might say. In this context, Jesus is speaking as a man. He's looking up into heaven. He's longing for that day that he might be returned to the Father. For the Father is greater than I, he says. And so what does all this mean for us? Well, it means that our joy is to be found in the fact that Jesus has returned to the Father. That should be our joy. That Jesus actually fulfilled the work that he came to do. And he is now seated at the right hand of the Father. He accomplished his work. If the disciples were rebuked for not wanting to lose him, we are to be praised, you might say, for letting him go. (laughs) For having that disposition, for taking up joy that he accomplished his work and he's in heaven with the Father. It's our joy to let him go because we know what it means. We know what it means that he's not here. Hebrews 12.2 says, For the joy that was set before him, For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. No doubt there was pain in the offering. First the agony of the cross, but then the ecstasy of heaven. 
That was his. Certainly, joy took, certainly Jesus took joy in being re- reunited with the Father. In your presence, there's fullness of joy, Psalm 16. In your presence, there's fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Jesus longed for that. And he knew what it felt like because he was there. And he took on the form of a man, and then he just longed to be back with the Father. No doubt. He took joy in triumphing over sin. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having defeated the devil. He took joy in the restoration of his divine rights. He is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. He he returned to that position of power. I'm, I'm sure Jesus took joy in being surrounded by the praise of all the people of whom he died for. You remember that verse in Luke 15? There will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. Imagine the angels praising God and Jesus with them, rejoicing over every conversion. Every time the light comes on and someone's regenerated, every time we crucify sin, every time we share our faith, Jesus is up there rejoicing in the presence of God, the Father. It's too much. (laughs) So what about us? What about our joy? John 15, 11. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. That your joy may be full. This joy is in us. The joy of Christ is ours. God is the, the source of true joy. You might say, I know that, but John, I'm joyless. I'm joyless. I know that's true, but I don't feel a lot of joy right now in my life. Well, something from the context in the verse I just read, John 15, verse 10 If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. There's something to be said about keeping his commandments. Jesus is saying that how you live your daily Christian life is directly connected to joy. That's the truth. Joy is the barometer of your spiritual life. Understand, Christian joy is not the power of positive thinking. That's not what we're talking about. We talk about Christian joy. It's not some bubbly, optimistic personality. It doesn't mean we walk through life with a naive, glass-half-full kind of attitude. That's not what Christian joy is. Joy is the emotion of salvation. Joy comes as the result of seeing, knowing, loving, and trusting Jesus Christ. Joy is a glorious gladness and deep delight in the person of Jesus Christ. And true joy is a work of the Holy Spirit found in those who regularly gaze into the glories of Christ. If you're not gazing into the glories of Christ, you're not going to have joy because He is the source of true joy. You can't manufacture joy. But every time we seek to find our highest joy in something other than God, we're snuffing at it. We're snuffing out true joy. Oh, joy's over there. We're just snuffing out true joy. When our joy dips, the tendency is to look to our circumstances and they contribute that our situation is the cause of our joylessness. We do this all the time. And so we try to change our circumstance. We try to change our situation. Because we point our finger at the situation or the circumstance and say, that's the reason why I don't have joy. So I lack joy because I hate my job. I don't. (laughs) It's rhetorical. Uh, Right? I lack joy because I hate my job. If I change my job, 
then I'll have joy. Well, guess what? That's an idol. Your job is your idol at that point, if that's, if that's your thinking. Or if I lived in that city, then I would have joy. Right? So the city is the idol. The move is the idol because you're blaming the circumstance. I don't have joy because of the situation I'm in, the circumstance that I'm in. Those are idols. If I had a better family, if I had a better upbringing, if I married that person, it's blaming the, circum- the situation. So I just have to change the situation, then I'll find true joy. It doesn't work that way. What is it, grass is always greener? Greener grass syndrome? Always looking over the fence for the next thing that's going to bring you joy. And those are all just idols. The joy that Christ offers is greater and stronger than any trouble that comes into your life. This is true joy. Jesus is teaching us that the rejoicing we do, and the Bible teaches us that the rejoicing we do and the joy that is ours cannot be snuffed out by our circumstances. So even though we walk through these trials and these really difficult circumstances, true joy can't be snuffed out if we're gazing at our Savior. Why else would Habakkuk say this? Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield, yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no er- herd in the stalls. So I need to go over to that city where there is fruit, and there are f- animals. That's not what he says, right? He doesn't say that. He says, there's nothing here for me. There's absolutely nothing. Yet, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. That's joy. It's not dependent on the circumstance or the situation. How can Habakkuk say that? Because he understood this. He understood it. Even without the Holy Spirit. (laughs) At least not the way we have it. Not the indwelling Holy Spirit. This means we have to topple over whatever, whatever idol of circumstance we're blaming for the cause of our despair. We have to topple it over. Just push it over. I'm saying that to myself because <laughs> I struggle with this immensely. I need this. Topple it over and look to, to Him as the true source of joy because anything else is an idol. In toppling over such an idol, we have to put gospel truths on video in our hearts. We have to preach the gospel to ourselves. Remember that quote from Paul Tripp? So good. No one is more influential in your life than you are because no one talks to you more than you do. (laughs) I love that. (laughs) You got to say the right things to yourself. Four facts teach us that our every true need is found in God so that we might look to him as the fountainhead of true life. God is the source of true revelation, the source of true peace, the source of true joy. And finally, God is the source of true security, the source of true security. Look down at John 14, verses 30 and 31. I will, no, I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me. But I do as the Father has commanded me so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us go from here. Just a couple thoughts on this point. The ruler that's coming is, of course, Satan. That's what he's talking about here. You remember before Judas left the room, back in chapter 13, John tells us that Satan entered into Judas Iscariot, and so he was going to go do what he was going to do. Satan is called the ruler of this world in the sense that he's the ruler of this world's evil system of rebellion against God. If you're confused about that, 
Jesus was in conflict with Satan for some time. Satan was likely behind Herod's attempt to kill Jesus when he was a baby. You remember that. Satan had appeared to Jesus while he was fasting in the wilderness, tempted him to sin. And throughout his ministry, Satan incited men against him, against Jesus. You remember Jesus told the religious leaders that opposed him, you are of your father, the devil. So Satan has been trying to get Jesus, to kill Jesus for his entire earthly ministry. The conflict with Satan would reach its climax, climax at the cross. Satan finally succeeded in killing Jesus. However, he only brought about his own destruction, as we know. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8 tells us the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. And Hebrews 2.14 says that through death he destroyed the one who had the power of death, that is, the devil. When Jesus says there in John 14.30, he has no claim on me, he means that. He means just that. Satan could not hold him in death. He has no claim on me. This phrase is a, it's kind of an idiom. It's an idiomatic way of saying, Satan can make no legal claim against me. Jesus was not of this world and he never sinned. What charge could Satan ever bring against Jesus? He was perfect. If Satan has no claim over Jesus and Jesus took victory over Satan through his indestructible life, then Jesus, our God, is the source of true security. You realize that security is a myth, right? It's a total lie. You can bar the doors. You can lock the door. You can hire a security guard. But you never know. Somebody could still break in. Security is a complete myth. You could be the best driver in the world. And driving home from church, somebody could come into your lane, hit you head on, and kill you. You have no idea whether or not that's going to happen. You think you do, but you don't. I could die before I preach this sermon. I could fall dead. <laughs> I have no idea what's actually going to happen. None of us do. Whatever you believe about your own security, it's a mirage. It really is. In every moment and in every direction, there's nothing but unknowns. That's the truth. So then how should we live? Should we give up? Throw your hands up in the air? Declare life worthless? No. We declare that Jesus, that the living God, is the source of true security. Only Him can we trust. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad, the psalmist declares, and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also deals, dwells secure. It's the only place that we can find security is in his indestructible life, Jesus. Do you believe that God is the source of true revelation, the source of true peace, the source of true joy, and the source of true security. I hope you believe that. I hope you maybe believe it a little bit more. At the end of the sermon, maybe we move the needle a little bit. I hope so. Do you believe that the living God is the fountainhead of true life? Everything comes from him. We have to have a true encounter with God for this to be real. Right? Idols have to be replaced. If we uproot them, they just grow back. They have to be replaced. And so we have to have an encounter with God. We're talking about the Holy Spirit the last two weeks. You remember these words from Paul. He writes to the believer, Because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. That's relationship language. This living God, this fountainhead of true life, he's a personal God that we actually cry out, Abba, Daddy, Papa. For all that God is, as transcendent as he is, as immense as he is, for all the ways that we can't relate to him, the chasm that exists between us and God that we'll never traverse, 
That God, it's eminently uh, trend, uh, up there, we also cry out, Abba, Father. Somehow, we can find a way to be in relationship with God through the power of the Holy Spirit. God has given us that privilege through the Spirit. We cry out, Abba, Father. And if we have that kind of encounter with him, then he truly is the source of every need in our life. Amen? Joel.